welcome to tonight's stream, School of Astronomy. For those about to stream, we salute you. Tonight we share with you some old favourites of the night sky, but before we begin, I would like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges to the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community, and we pay our respect to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Tor Torres Strait Islander people today. Uh, tonight's stream is proudly sponsored by Optics Central, who are the, uh, I guess, the gift givers for the current raffle that we have going. Uh, that'll be drawn at the Messy Star Party. Uh, also, remember, if you're enjoying tonight's stream on Facebook, you can donate stars. Those on YouTube can donate stickers. Uh, and all donations, no matter how large or small, are very welcome. And if you're watching us for the first time, don't forget to subscribe on YouTube or follow us on Facebook. Um, but before we get started, we'll bring everybody in to the stream. We have Lee with us tonight. Evening. We have, or well, the front yard astronomer, sorry, we have Andy. Hey, Pagan. The Hello. artist otherwise known as AM. Anne Marie. Hello. And the trendy science teacher, Neil. The only person who's allowed to name anybody anything is me. Because we've got Bill Stanton, <laughs> Telescope Gents, and we have Planisphere Man, and Gerald Gretsch as well. So I'll come up with a name for you. Don't worry about that. Um, but to those watching, if there's anything you want to know about any of the objects that we're sharing with you tonight, um, I won't be able to answer them, but hopefully Neil and the others can, can give you some insight into the object we're looking at. And we thought because the moon's up at the moment, we might start with the moon. And I'm... Um, that, that looked like a nice can of fizzy drink there, Andy. Yep. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, we go. The moon. So I'm going to throw it straight to you, Neil. I'm going to be mean and nasty and ask you, and, and Andy as well, if we can have a yeah. bit of a chat about uh, what we're looking at. It's I'll go around a bit. Are you going to move around a bit? Well, look yeah. at that lovely, those lovely white spots up the top there. Do you know why they're white, Mark? Uh, I believe they've got ejector ray popping out of them, don't they? Exactly. So, yeah, the moon is uh, a pretty rough surface, but a lot of the area smooths over time. So um, the areas that you see that are brighter are rougher areas, and they reflect the light in more. So they, they scatter the light more, and that makes them appear lighter. Uh, and that's because they are more recent. And when we're saying recent, we're talking, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of years as opposed to millions or billions of years. So um, that's why they appear lighter. But the moon itself is actually a very dark colour. Uh, if you were to have the moon in the size of your hand and you were to look at it under daylight, it would look about as dark as a piece of coal. So it's a very, very dark object. The only reason why it looks so bright at night is because it's reflecting all the sunlight. Um, we've got you know nothing else to compare it with. It's our eyes are you know adapted to the to the darkness. Uh, and so it, it looks bright because it's reflecting all that sunlight. But uh, if you had it in daylight to compare with other things around you, it would look very, very dark. There you go. Now, I just wanted to say, oh, whoops, Neil, you've got a local watching. Hey, hey, Margie. <laughs> I'm a cockatoo resident myself. Oh, we've also got Beatrice watching from Belgium. How cool is that? I can't Going around to be the world. a neighbour of yours. Welcome. Still a neighbour. Now, the uh, lovely dark spots there, Neil, the, as I like to call them, the mares, the mare. Uh, you're talking what about do we know about mare? The there. So mare is Latin for sea or ocean. And when um, ancient astronomers used to look up to the moon, at least those who um, gave it the names, the Latin names, um, they obviously they didn't have telescopes back then and so they saw these dark patches and they thought well they look like oceans so perhaps there's water on the moon and we're seeing big oceans up there uh, and so they gave them the name mare collectively and each individual one has its own name such as uh, mare tranquillitatis the famous sea of tranquility where the uh, apollo 11 astronauts landed and they are actually the result of not water but lava so uh, when the moon was very, very young, it had a thin crust relative to what it is now. And sometimes some of the very large objects that were floating around the solar system in those early days would impact 
on the moon and the very largest ones would create big holes punched through the moon's thin crusts and the lava would then flow out and fill the uh, low areas around it. It would flood the moon in that area. Uh, eventually, of course, that lava would cool, but because the majority of the bombardment of the moon had already happened before that point, then the areas that had been flooded with lava didn't receive as many uh, impacts afterwards as the rest of the moon had already seen. And so they remain relatively smooth and flat. Remember I said earlier that if it's smooth, it's darker, and if it's white, it's rougher. Um, that's why the, the mare, the, the oceans and the moon, look a lot darker. Partly that, and partly also because of the, the material in the lava. Now, am I right in saying that those mare, the lava that, that we can see there, some of them are quite, it's quite thick. Like the layer um, of it, some of them are quite thick and others aren't as thick as, some aren't, not as thick as some. <laughs> well, I, I don't know the, the geology of the moon to that level of detail. I couldn't tell you how thick those lava plains were, but um, certainly in places they could be quite thick because for them to spread that far, obviously they needed to, to rise out of the, the moon's, from behind, beneath the moon's crust enough to push the, the lava flows out to you know several hundreds of kilometres across. Because the moon from limb to limb is about the same as Australia from east to west coast. So these mare are huge. They're bigger than any lakes in Australia. They're the size of the Great Australian Bight. So they are very large. And to push the lava all that way, it would obviously need to have been a significant flow. And so I'd imagine it would be quite thick uh, towards the middle of them. I'm just checking a few things out. Looks like some people are having a little bit of trouble with the stream. Don't you love that technology? Well, I thought we got rid of all of our little aliens last night, but it turns out that we haven't. Uh, Maybe Sean it's the gremlins this time. That you can only see a black screen. Sean, no, you won't see a black screen. You should see a giant moon on your screen. It's not the Death Star, though. It is the moon, I promise you. My first suggestion to those sort of technical issues is always to just try refreshing the yeah. page that yeah. you're viewing on. Spot on. Now, is there anything, I'm trying to work out if there's anything particular we can uh, look at detail-wise on the moon tonight. Anyway, any, oh, he's got, he's all good, he's fixed, there we go. Well, welcome aboard, Sean, on, glad to have you. Oh, the Apennines. They're named right, after Mark, the what do you know about the Apennines? I'm not so familiar with them. Oh, I know they're named after the Italian mountains, that much I know, and they're the longest one of the longest mountain ranges that we know of something some ridiculous length in size so i know that as some reason i'm getting 600 kilometers or something yeah in my six, 600 610 something yeah, like that quite long one of the longest mountain ranges going around quite tall as well they certainly I look it from that angle claire will be happy to know that i remembered that <laughs> claire is the asv's astronomy ambassador oh, and she, she is, is a, she a is. professional astronomer me. and very knowledgeable she would have told me off if I had got that wrong. But, yes, it's quite a large mountain range. It's um, quite an impressive mountain range as well. Now, those watching, do we know uh, – Do we, sorry, do we have any questions while we're at it, while we're waiting for the moon to sort of – well, not the moon, for the sky to get a little bit darker for the guys to um, start streaming some of the really cool stuff? I mean, the moon's cool, don't get me wrong. Um but it's just a it's just a light thief that steals steals from the sun anyway. That's why I don't know too much about the moon. It's it's an object that I don't enjoy looking at very much because it, it excludes the the views of everything else. That is true. It ruins the fun for deep sky guys. So Mark, Nick's got a question. If you want to put that up on screen for everyone, I to see. am going to pop that up. Yes, you beat me to it. It's a good question as well. And unfortunately, I can't really answer. I don't. I have to answer. I don't know. But I'd say it's more likely to have been caused by impact than it would have been to be caused by whatever causes or what causes the uh, mountains to form on Earth, which is uh, continental migration and continental drift. Um, because there is no such thing on the Moon. Uh, the at least as far as we've been able to determine, the Moon didn't have uh, enough geological processes to be able to push around 
um, plates of, of, the, of crusts on its surface uh, and, and form um, mountain ranges like we do here on Earth. So I, I would say that it's quite possible that it is uh, the, the result of impact crater. And you can see there that that range it's sort of making a semicircular shape and it's around uh, uh, one of the large mare, um, one of the depressions in the moon. So I'd say that's quite likely the result of being a, a crater from a very, very large impact. I can confirm that that is, is the case. And I can also confirm that they're around about 4 billion years old. Oh, thank you for that confirmation. All right. Now we've got a follow on question. If the mountain range is 600 odd kilometers long, how large are the craters? Huge. Yeah. <laughs> Many it's tens of kilometres wide. Um, the the craters that form the mare are many tens to hundreds of kilometres wide. So uh, absolutely gigantuan. The the reason why we see so many craters on the moon and why they are so large compared to what we've ever seen here on Earth is that the Earth has an atmosphere and the moon does not, or at least the moon has an incredibly tenuous atmosphere that does not really affect its surface at all. So erosion over time has erased the uh, the craters from the surface of the Earth, and as well um, the movement of the tectonic plates. Uh, as soon as a plate gets subducted under another one, then anything that was on that surface plate is now underneath the, the crust and turned back into molten lava. Uh, and anything that stayed above was probably crushed into a mountain range, and that would obliterate any craters. So. The Earth would have seen as many impacts as the Moon, even more because it's larger back in its very, very early days. But they would have been almost entirely wiped out. We only see uh, a dozen or two craters visible on the Earth, and none of them are as large as anything that we can see uh, through our telescopes here on Earth on the Moon. We're all jumping around from computer to computer. Hang on a second. It looks like we might jump to another another part of the moon if we can, Andy. See what else we can find. Yep. I'll just see if I can see the dark side a bit better. I'll knock oh, the game yeah. right up. I'll let you take control for a second then, Andy. All it's yours. a little bit windy at the moment, but I'm looking at these creases in the mare. You can sort of see them if I knock the contrast right up but you know move up the the terminator as they call it that's the and line should... between the shadow and the daylight that's it right and i'll just i guess on earth we would call that sunset or sunrise yeah mm. I'll just, just it's a bit tricky to get this contrast right oh no but it's pretty severe the terminator but that's where you get the the best um views along the terminator you get real shadows and you can you get the real 3d especially looking through a telescope you get that real 3d look um it's like putting a torch along the uh the flat surface of a wall in your house and you can suddenly see how lumpy and bumpy the wall actually is when it's always looked flat it really the shadows at the low angles really bring out the the uh the, the detail of the surface I'll just knock the contrast down a bit. It's a, it's a real. No, I have to knock it down to there. Um, I'll just keep moving up. I mean, I could change, put my barlows on. This is just a single ASI um, planetary camera. Um, in my Newtonian, it's a six inch Newtonian. Um, but I've got a doubler and then I can double it again, so I can go four times this if you want. It'll, it'll Let's be good quickly for do that to see what we get, shall we? Okay, probably you won't to, be yep. the best possible view because of the amount of wind and the air movement, yeah. but uh, it will certainly I can put be a doubler on a doubler will be might be okay, not four times, I think just twice should be okay, but. This will be a great demonstration for our audience as well of how much of an effect... Oh, there was a bird flying across there. Yeah, that's all that too. <laughs> how much of an what effect the, the atmosphere has on the visibility of things in the night sky. Okay. Well, if you... if you um Actually, if you uh, flick to mine, you'll see what's um, the atmosphere coming off my roof. There we go. Because is... of where I am with this, the moon is 
just over the top of the uh, the roof line, which is a terracotta roof, and you can see all that heat just coming straight off. So I can't get proper focus at the like moment. Jelly. Danielle, very, don't very, don't, don't worry about water. asking lots of questions. Keep them coming. So we, she, Danielle asked another question, um, but I think we've moved on from where it was. So Just quickly for Danielle, uh, I will say that it's very hard to remember all the different names of all the different craters because there are many of them uh, and they all kind of look alike. But you can go online and do a, a search for uh, moon map and that will give you all the names of the in, in, most interesting features. And I believe Google even has a, um, a Google moon where you can scroll around and look at the uh, high resolution images of the surface of the moon we have just like they have with Google Earth. So that might be worth searching for. Yes, Google Moon. Google's got um, Mars as well. Yes, they do. Yeah. Bit of fun for all. I think Andy's nearly got his... Look at the moon wobble there from the heat off the roof there. Yeah, that is horrible. It's uh, hard to get focus as well in this condition because the moon just doesn't oh, stay just still. Wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't easy, looking close It's easy to pressed, get no focus. <laughs> yeah, I pressed course instead of um, fine. <laughs> yeah you can really see actually it's it's making those ejector ray pop quite a lot there it, it could be a lot better than this though unfortunately know, the yeah, conditions tonight aren't ideal no um, yeah if anyone, we start with the moon no if anyone thinks this looks like we're looking through a mirage or trying to look at a picture through a swimming pool that's exactly what is happening the uh the different densities of the atmosphere uh, which change as a result of the hot air, evap or not evaporating, but uh, rising off the surface of the earth or high winds blowing through the view. They change the density of the air, which changes the, how much it, it bends and refracts the light, just like when we're looking at um, uh, mirages uh, on the surface of the earth. It's bending the light, and so that causes the image to be distorted. And it's most visible on the moon because you can see it moving the entire image across the whole screen. But it still also happens when we're looking at stars and other fainter objects. It's just not as easy to see um, with small objects. But believe me, it has a bigger, uh, big effect on the resulting images that we can collect. So um, that's why we want to put telescopes up in space like the Hubble and the newly launched James Webb. Now, I think uh, Beatrice had a question. Are we using filters to image the moon? Andy, Lee, we're on your images. Are you using filters? Uh, no, this is just, no. it's on it's on the infrared uh, filter at the moment because if I flick to, well, uh, let's just quickly change this. You actually see the colors wrong there. If I change to a red filter, it goes red. If I go to the green filter, it goes green. So we're seeing the different wavelengths come through. If I go to infrared, it's just the closest to no filter at all um, because, as we know, the, the moon is pretty much just very white when we see it. So to get rid of this horrible yellow colour, I just change and tell it to go pretty much go mono. The other advantage of... Yeah, go on, sorry. The other advantage of using a, a red filter is that um, the longer wavelengths of light are affected less by the movement of the atmosphere. And so it will look a little bit more stable, um, but it may have a very slight decrease in the uh, the resolution because a longer wavelength has a little bit less, little, little, little bit less detail. But I mean, compared to um, the effects that it has on the atmosphere and its turbulence uh, using a red filter, will make things a little bit better. But, of course, you don't have to use a filter. Now, Andy. Yep. I'll go back down this, to the Apennines. Is this your four times Barlow, is it? No, this is two times at the moment. Oh, two times. I'm put the two in. Right, that's so really impressive looking right that's now. That's seriously impressive. Impressive. Right, just impressive. Get, I'll just get the contrast. Okay, so wind still. But I'll just bring it up a little bit. Not, Oh, lovely. Look at that. Nice. Look at the detail in the craters as well. You can start to see rills. Like these are collapsed lava tubes that where my mouse is. Yeah. Um, 
there's some really nice reels down here. See if I can. I haven't got my. my I've got to hook my Nintendo controller up. Um, it's an old. <laughs> and that's what I've run, but I've got, I'm using a. I'll just. I'll be one minute, and I'll, that'll be working a treat. So when we take images of the moon, uh, we usually record a video of it in very, very short frame uh, lengths. So, you know, hundredths of a second or less of the exposure time. And the reason we do that is we try to freeze this mo movement. You can, if you pick a feature on the moon and look at it for a while, you'll notice that sometimes it looks blurry, but sometimes it goes a bit clearer just for a moment. What we try to do is pick out those moments and for each part of the image, choose the image that has the best view of that particular feature. And then some of our, our very clever software joins all those together and we end up with a, uh, a cleaner, higher resolution image that shows detail across the whole picture uh, from picking and choosing the best bits of many, many photos. Um, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, Sega. Oh, okay, we'll come back to Sega. Yeah, no, we're not doing Nebula yet. So, and plus, Sega cigar still in the uh, naughty corner from last night. I haven't let him out yet. Oh, I didn't yeah. catch that. No, you missed that one. All right. So, the question here is: How do you get good focus on the moon when it's all swimming around like that? Um, trial and error. It's it's pretty difficult to be confident that what you're seeing is atmospheric disturbance and not focus issues. Um, well, it's probably easiest if you just pick a, an object on the moon to look at and then watch it for a few seconds and then change your focus and watch it for a few seconds more and see if it looks better or worse. And just keep doing that until you find the sweet spot where it looks best. Oh, here we go. Jess is a new ASV member. Welcome aboard, Jess. Welcome to another stream. Is there a benefit in using a Barlow over a lens capable of the same magnification? No. If you can get a lens better or like an eyepiece, but it's a cam it's to do with the camera and the lens size. Uh, Barlow's just you're just adding more glass and you're adding more error. So if I had a, like a 12-inch Newtonian, It'd probably be clearer, but then again, it's it's all to do with the night. You know, you, you get to a certain point, like if I had a forty-inch mirror, it's all to do with atmosphere. It might it just it exaggerates what atmosphere is up there, and it's like sitting on the bottom of a swimming pool, and if it's ripply on top, it's very similar to how the atmosphere works. Right, spider, so sorry, <laughs> I just had a spider. I'm not a bad one. <laughs> Yeah, I've, 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 there's been spiders in here. <laughs> I'm in the tent. Yep. Trevor wants to know how high the Apennines. Um, I think from memory they're about five, six kilometres high, I think. Pretty yep. sure that's right. I'm just Pretty doing sure a that's right. Search. They're about five to six kilometres high. Very, very – I'm confident about that number. I'm probably wrong, but, you know. We'll let let Noel confirm that. Five and a half thousand meters. There we go. I was pretty much spot on. Go me. Yeah, Fifty four hundred. I've got on Google. <laughs> I'm remembering stuff, Neil. I yeah. even called you Neil. You did. Yeah. <laughs> it may help yeah, that yeah, Noel's yeah. not actually in in chat tonight. No, he's not. And I think he's confused. I think what we might do now, though, is jump across to some nebula. Um, you mean some nebulae? That's the plural. Oh, nebulae, nebula, <laughs> nebulae, mare, mare, potato, potato. We're gonna no jump one says potato, by the way. Oh, no, <laughs> nobody says potato. <laughs> I'm going to start saying it now just so that somebody says it. And then and then once I jump onto this next image, then, Neil, you can answer Cigar's um, question. So this Absolutely. is from Anne Marie's. This is from Anne Marie's uh, computer. This is five images. How long are your exposures? It looks like that last image was um, a bit blurry. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> it is a windy night tonight. Yeah. yeah you can yep. really it was blurry. all good up until four. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to go backwards. If that's a blurry image, I'd like to see the good one. No, <laughs> just, just look at the stars. The stars are all elongated. Look. 
Yeah, yeah. I, oh, even yeah. I can. That's, that's like terrible. Phone. That's, that can you exclude like image. an image from your stack? <laughs> Sorry? Can you exclude an image from the stack? I can, but I'd have to start the stack again. But I can do that. Oh, start a new one. Let's, let's start a new one, shall we? Okay. I think the result will be worth stack. it. While we do that, uh, we'll just jump back to the moon again. And there's one last question. Yeah. Nick wants to know why there are a lot more craters at the top. Is it just due to the position of the sun making it look like there are more, or is there another reason? Has anyone got a wide view of the moon? Uh, uh, yeah, the we moment? do. We've got one right here. There we go. Just got it. All right. So the top that we were looking at uh, a moment ago is now on the left, and that's actually the south of the moon. So um, there is a lot of craters to the south, that's for sure. Um as for the reason why, um, I'm not entirely sure. It may be to do with the shape that the moon was when it was being formed. And you can see that the, a lot of the mare, uh, which are more in the north of the moon, to the right in this view, uh, they are in that area as well. So the, the crater of the, or sorry, the crust of the moon to the south may have formed a bit thicker or a bit sooner. And that's why there are more craters visible. They haven't been covered up by other, uh, by mare. Um, they, they call that area the Southern Highlands, and uh, it's actually one of the places where um, it's likely that the next uh, crewed moon mission will return to because the, uh, the South Pole region has uh, a, a fantastic combination of some areas that are permanently in shadow where ice can be formed and therefore uh, used to uh, support a base. Um, and on the tips of those craters, they're around the rim, uh, there are areas that are always in sunlight, which is great for generating power with solar power. So as for the geological reasons why that particular area is, is more heavily cratered, I couldn't be specific. I couldn't give you the answer to that. But I think it's it's mostly to do with the fact that there's no Maria, uh, Maria in that area to cover it up. That's when we break out into song. Ave, <laughs> Ave Maria. Oh, I was thinking, how do you solve a problem like Maria? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> didn't we do sound of? Didn't we, we did do the, the sound of music economy we, we a few weeks ago? Music just before New Year's, yes. Did you do that, um, Jake? I, I'm yes. pretty no, sure we, we, we didn't because we didn't have the moon up. <laughs> ah. Brenton, uh, last one on the moon for Brenton. Um, would an atmospheric dispersion corrector work on the moon? I'm not sure. I'm assuming that's one of the uh, the amateur level um, adaptive optics type uh, instruments. And if I'm if I'm not correct, please uh, correct me. But um, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I do know that astronomers, amateur astronomers, have used a, a basic type of adaptive optics to improve the sharpness of their deep sky photography. Uh, I don't know. Yeah if it would work on the moon. I'd imagine yep. the air condition is similar, so it should, but the way we take images of the moons with very short exposure time would also help compensate for that. Yeah. Um, in fact, I can answer that um, the director of Lunar and Planetary, Stuart Beveridge. He's probably um, He Yeah, well, he purchased uh, an ADC, uh, I'm going to say a few months ago. Um, the clouds haven't stopped since. We know that. It's Stuart's um, fault. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he does live nearby me. So, um, but yeah, and he obviously is a you know, lunar and planetary person as opposed to deep sky. So it, it sort of answers the fact that, yes, it probably would because I don't think he would have picked it up otherwise. I look forward to seeing the results of that once he's uh, able to get some clear skies to try it. Yeah, I, don't, I think he got it just before the just before the end of our planetary season, unfortunately. So maybe, yes, yeah, I think he's tested it once, but I don't know how it worked, or how it came out. But maybe he's tested a couple of times. Who knows? I'm sure he's used it though. So, all right. So is that we're going to go. Grill we're looking at now, Andy. Oh. Yeah, that's. I think this is a. It's a chain of craters. You can see where my my mouse. Oh, sorry, where my mouse is going. This chain here. They're just a series of craters in a. In a big row, oh, actually. I see. So and rather than a, like a valley, it's a it's a yeah, continuous yeah, crater from multiple craters. fragments. Yeah, it's it's weird. It's, it must have just been hit on such an angle, and they just sprayed in that line or in the same meteor bounced or something. Or it could have been line. a comet that broke up, like Schumacher Levy Nine did before it hit Jupiter. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah. In but in a, a, it didn't go out wide. It just it, a direct line. There's a few on the moon craters all in a row. Um, 
I've just I think the reels are more in the dark at the moment. You can I see that it is like um well a couple more days to to where the Polo guys went. A couple of days. Like, couple of days. Right? She'll be right, mate. Mm. Beautiful. Uh I'm going up to tranquil I'll just turn the contrast. I'll go to, to tranquility base. The um, eagle has landed. Yep. Where are we? Up here a bit. Oh, here we go. It's a bit bright at the yep. moment. <laughs> Down from the dot. <laughs> we, we worked out what it was. It wasn't a couple of craters. It's a lunar skid mark. A lunar skid mark. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm going to the box after that, haven't you? I much prefer the lunar skid mark. <laughs> I reckon we're here somewhere. It's somewhere around here, I'm sure. Uh, uh, other where... side. It's near the... This side? Um, just up from the... Two, no, yeah, no, further over to the left. Mm. Below the yep. bright dot, I think. No, no, no. <laughs> no, on that same where you were. Yep. See how you got the two oh, yeah, craters? Yeah, here, yeah, right here, you mean? It's like the uh, blind no, leading the blind. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> to the right. I was about right. to say where my mouse is, but yeah, so down from there. A little yeah, bit it's down where Lee's mouse is that nobody can see. Oh, yeah, because it's too... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somewhere there. Yeah. That looks like Somewhere it. All right. It looks I'm going to be a party happy. pooper, and I'm going to move yep. us on to Anne-Marie's screen because she's back, and she's uh, okay, and I'll, and I'll clearer than Marie's. ever. There Including the satellite. Uh, that's a, a very <laughs> poor quality two-stack image from Anne-Marie. Very poor. It's <laughs> embarrassing to show it. I know. <laughs> Uh, before we get on to those, j just quickly, Sean, yes, the moon does have moonquakes. I don't know why, but I know it does. It's not entirely geologically dead yet. <clears throat> there yeah, is still some right, activity right, right. going on. Oh, also, it has a, a very, very large neighbour. Um, we have tides on Earth caused by the moon orbiting the Earth. Well, the Earth is uh, much larger than the moon, and it has an effect on the moon as well. So... Every time the moon goes around the Earth, it's squished and distorted a little bit, and that <clears throat> that can cause some some moon quakes. Amory, looks like you caught Starlink in there. I did. There's more than Starlink up there. Mm. I know, I know. But at it's the moment, it's about a fifty-fifty. It's just it's the current just the trend at the moment to pick on Starlink. So mm. it was easily a hundred of them I caught during doing Rosette last week. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So here we are. This is. How, how long are your exposures, Amory? Just at 60 seconds. For some so reason, it's only stacked two of my eight that I had. So, so this is I'll see two it... minutes of yep. Peter Carina and the keyhole. Dead centre of it. The actual keyhole. Mm. Yeah, that's not, right. Not, not, <laughs> not the pretend one that Lee found. Mm -mm. Full one. <laughs> so trendy science teacher. I'm going to throw oh, yeah. this one across to you now with the... Uh, yep. Because I know you'll have fun with this one. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, this is a very famous, very bright, very beautiful nebula called the Eta Carina Nebula. It's named for the star Eta Carina, which is the bright one smack bang in the middle there. Uh, we're very lucky. It's a southern hemisphere object. Those in the northern hemisphere either can't see it at all or can only see it very, very low on the horizon. Um, so we're very lucky to have this gorgeous gorgeous object in our view uh, as i said it's it's the largest nebula that you can see from the earth at least it takes up the uh the largest field of view um of, of the bright nebulae that is there's lots of very large very faint nebulae um but this one is also one of only two that can be seen with the naked eye the other being the uh, great orion nebula uh, but this is a larger uh in the sky than the orion nebula so Getting back to Ida Carina itself, it is one of the uh, the main sources of illumination for this gas and dust. The, that's what a nebula is, a cloud of gas and dust. Uh, and the energy coming out from Ida Carina is causing the uh, atoms in that gas and dust to absorb some of that energy. It, uh, it, they, they can't hold on to that energy for very long because they are unstable. And when they... Um, lose that energy they do that in the form of a photon so a packet of light uh, and incidentally it's at a very specific 
fre uh, frequency, a very specific color of light, depending on the type of gas that is uh, that is absorbing that energy. So in, in the case of the vast majority of nebulae, that is hydrogen, and hydrogen glows a uh, pinkish blue color. Uh, this is a monochrome image that we're seeing here, obviously, uh, uh, but I assume that um, Anne-Marie is capturing this using one of her narrow band filters, which captures no. the light. No, no, this is a full color? This, no, this is a lum luminance. Ah, uh, okay, right. So yeah, what luminance does is it captures pretty much all the photons that are coming from a subject. And that means it's uh, conglomerating all the different colors together to give a, a total brightness value. So we're seeing all of those different gases emitting their different colors and uh, capturing the, the brightness of that particular area. Oops, that was me. Sorry, guys. And I see we have a new person joining us. Hello, Jen. Jen's Hi, jumping up Swan Hill. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Jen. Good evening. We have a question. We have a question. Should I use any filters with the eight-inch dob while looking at nebula? I say yes. I, I say yes, it, definitely. It, it, Oxygen. It certainly all yeah. depends on what you're wanting to do. Yeah, O3 yeah. or a hydrogen even. Uh, no, not hydrogen. O3, O3, especially mm -hmm. for um, tarantula. You're on nebula and tarantula. Yeah, yeah. What, what a filter will do, like an O3 filter, is it will eliminate the colors of light that come from outside the spectrum of, of what is described as. So an O3 filter is trying to highlight the emission of light from oxygen atoms. Just like I mentioned a moment ago with hydrogen atoms being pink, uh, oxygen when it glows is a, a sort of a greeny blue, a teal color. And if you use one, it'll actually make the object appear darker because it's cutting out a lot of the light, for example, the hydrogen light. But what it does do is it makes it more contrasty so that even though it appears fainter, it appears to show more detail. So on an 8-inch Dobsonian, that would be good, but it would be best from a dark sky, as is the case with all um, night sky observing. But particularly when using filters, because things are going to get a bit darker, you want to get into a place with as little light pollution as possible. Uh, and that's the same true for the Orion Nebula, which is the question you asked earlier. Uh, yes, a, a green or an oxygen filter would be best for that. Um, but again, that will eliminate all the light from hydrogen alpha, which is the predominant color in the, in the Milky Way, in the universe, with its um, emission of hydrogen. Um, and so you want to swap things out and see how the, the objects look with and without the filters. Uh, just quickly an aside... Be, Sorry, be, Mark. Just, and we just, just had a quick... question from Danielle that wasn't answered earlier. Oh, just... yeah, is the flag not standing? Yes, just quickly, though. Um, yep. Uh, I had a message from our illustrious Lunar and Planetary got, uh, Section Director, Stuart. He says it should work on the, mill, uh, on the moon, but he's not sure because he hasn't tested it yet. So there you go. That's for the ADC, Great. not the ACDC. <laughs> ACDC always works when you're doing uh, some deep sky observing. <laughs> it does. Is the flag so, not standing? Danielle, yes, it is. It is still standing. Uh, it's Unless it gets knocked over by a meteor impact, which is extraordinarily unlikely, it will still be standing. However, it will be white because the unfiltered UV light from the sun will have completely bleached all of the pigments on the, uh, the flag. So the Americans who are so proud of flying their red, white and blue stars and stripes are now <laughs> flying the white flag on the moon. The white flag of peace. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, good evening, Grampians. Sheep station, lead court sheep station watching. How cool I would is imagine that? you would have good dark skies there. I think yeah. Andrea has joined us a few times. She has joined us a few times, yes. Welcome back. Yeah, uh, you still only got two Still only got two stacks there, Anne Marie. Yeah, it's not it's not stacking. I've got about wow. ten shots here, and it's it's running through them all, but it's rejecting them. It's been <laughs> it says that it can't star align. Mm. I'm trying. To, I'm have... waiting for it to. I'm waiting for it to give me a moment when I can stop it. Not because I've got another <laughs> scope. On I'm just going to leave this on here now, just well. to cause you stress. No. And things. Do you it have installed deep sky me. stack alive? That might be an alternative uh, way to stack it. 
Now, I was hoping one of the other guys can get something up for us so we can let Anne-Marie try and fix her. Um, no, I've got another it. scope on it. Oh, you got it. Oh, look at that. She's just oh, hang on, she's no. all over it. We can watch you, the inner workings of to... Anne-Marie's live stacking here. <laughs> I'm actually just going to shut that down because then you can just see that. <laughs> In the meantime, I can answer Nick's question if you want to put that on screen. Mark. Yeah, go for it. Um, so we have one, I believe, image or video of uh, a Lunar Lander return module taking off. And yes, you can see that the, uh, the blast from the engine does indeed kick up a lot of dust, uh, blow the flag around a lot. But from what I remember, I don't remember it actually being blown over. I, I think it, it still remains standing. Uh, it was quite deeply... Um, the the, the um, the, the pole, the flagpole, is quite deeply embedded into the lunar rock. I don't know if that's the case with any of the other flags, but I don't believe on that one. I think it might have been Apollo 17, the last one. Um, the video seemed to show that the flag, while being blown quite hard, didn't actually leave the ground. Right. And Marie's coming back online. And this is with, uh, so you can see all of it now, all of Karina. Oh. This is with a color camera. But for some reason, I don't know why, but it does show it only up in mono on on this live stack. But, yeah, this is with the ED80 and the, the QHY268. So uh, a suggestion for you, Anne-Marie, there's a checkbox yeah. on the left that says image is color about halfway down. Uh, try yep. checking that and seeing if you can pick the right uh rgb combination it is rgb yeah. okay i don't like I mean, it in doesn't... color anyway it looks horrible <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look I good until you process it, it. <laughs> now that that's after processing mark when it comes raw out of the camera it's usually got horrendous color tints on it's it it's horrible <laughs> true i will agree with that i love it when it's finished yes even from my dodgy little phone. Hey, I think I can see Gabriella Mistral Nebula down there in the right hand corner, lower Thank right hand corner. Time. Bottom right. Yep. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yep. And Anne Marie, that is a better looking color image than I've ever got straight out of the out of their scope without mm. any um, 60 seconds. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. There we go. We got some color now. Now, who knows much about Gabriella Mistral Nebula? Silence. <laughs> no more than anything else. Silence. He was a poet. That's all she I was. know. She. she. She was a poet. <laughs> she was a poet. Yes. Argentinian, wasn't it? Correct. What do they call that, Neil, when you see the image of something in the stars? Pareidolia. It's Pareidolia. when you see that's... a human face in an un, uh, in a non-human object or pattern. That's the word. It's I like the, the Jesus, Jesus, the Jesus, Jesus cheese toast. sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, it's one of the few objects of the night sky that I think actually you can see the shape of it. When you get a, a close-up of it, you can actually see um, what it looks like. That it looks very similar to a side profile picture of her. One so of do we have any more uh, information about Eda Karina? Um, or, well, actually, I can mention the star itself because that is actually one of the most interesting objects in the night sky. The, the homunculus? Not even closer than that. We'll talk about the star itself. Okay. Um, the homunculus is a part of that, though. So yes. Eta Carina, the star itself, is actually not one star but two, and it is two of the brightest stars in the known universe. So that is pretty impressive that two of those stars being so bright are actually orbiting each other. Um, one of them is about 40 times the mass of the sun, so 40 suns inside that one star. The other is about 60 times the mass of the sun. And they're orbiting each other relatively close to each other. So as you can imagine, the amount of energy coming out of that system must be incredible. Um, and so the, the more massive star is actually cannibalizing the atmosphere of the other star. It, it's sucking off the surface of that star and bringing it into its own surface. And that doesn't happen in a smooth, even, continuous way. It... it happens in lumps and when you get a, a particularly large lump it can cause um what we call a nova which is when the star suddenly brightens um it gets much more visible um about 
I think it was 400 years ago, um, Eta Carina experienced a nova period when a very large chunk of the smaller star, about 30% of its mass, was absorbed by the larger star. And that created a gargantuan explosion, so big that the star became visible um, during the daytime for a while. And it left behind a, uh, a two-lobed explosion of gas and dust um, blown away from the, the, the double star, which is called the Homunculus Nebula because when it was first seen, seen through a telescope, uh, it appeared to the observer to look like a little person, which is what uh, Homunculus yeah. means. Uh, I don't see that. I just see it as a pair of potatoes stuck together. It's a peanut. It is like a peanut, yes. It is, isn't it? Like a peanut. <laughs> Chocolate-coated peanut, m and <laughs> It's a very spicy peanut, though, I can tell you. Very, very hot gas is there. Now, Nick, when is the next live stream? Well, <laughs> with us, with us, it could be tomorrow night. Who knows? <laughs> We kind of, um, we don't run to the beat of any particular drum. We just go, oh, we feel like doing a live stream. We try and give you guys as much notice as we can uh, before we do them. Uh, it depends on who's working, who's not working, who's free, who's not free. Um, who's inspired? Sorry? Who's inspired? I'm inspired every night. Yeah, who's inspired? <laughs> I, I'm always inspired. That's the problem. Though. I'm inspired, but I'm always in cloud. Yeah. Lee, Lee lives I'm... in cloud wood, so it all depends on whether Lee's got cloud or not um but yeah we we will try we try and do them as often as we can we had a little bit of a break over christmas what did we take we took a month off guys um but it's but new year feb it's our 100th year anniversary this year we're probably bound to do a heck of a lot of live streaming because we love doing it we love bringing it to you guys so um we will always give you as much notice as we can at, if we can give you at least five days notice we will um sometimes we might just uh, just throw an impromptu one in there as well. Um, so just keep watching YouTube for new streams to pop up in uh, coming soon, or, or and on Facebook as well. It, like, we'll always put them on there before we go before we go live and try and tell as many people as we can. Um, so yeah, yeah. Now this is this is Jen's screen. So how many images? How many minutes worth of imaging is this, Jen? It's only two minutes. Two minutes. I've got to get myself a better camera. <laughs> yes, you do. Move huh? up north. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> uh, look, I'm pretty happy. I got a I got a galaxy with my phone, so I'm I'm happy. Like I That's can very quit. impressive. <laughs> I can retire. <laughs> I'm done with that. Now, have we got guys jumping onto another object? Well, Cloudwood's not jumping onto another object. Andy, have you got one that you're moving to next I'm, for us? I've only just got my second camera in. Um, oh, move quicker, young I've man. had to swap cameras, swap, pull everything apart and swap everything, and now I'm focusing and aligning. Well, while, you're, while you're focusing and, and doing that, I might yep. just remind um, those watching at home that we do have the raffle going at the moment, and the raffle prize is a Saxon 200DS uh, Newtonian telescope on a Saxon HEQ5 go-to mount. Uh, steel tripod, uh, Saxon cello. I hope I said that right. HD 12 mil eyepiece, a Saxon ED 21 mil eyepiece, and a Saxon cello HD 25 mil eyepiece, all as part of the prize value of three thousand six hundred dollars. Uh, the prize includes couriered insured delivery. All of the funds raised for this um, raffle going to our remote observatory STEM project. Because the astronomy project is coming to a conclusion and will be uh, publicly launched at our Starbecue. Sorry, it's not the Starbecue. It's not Christmas, is it? Our Messier Star Party on the 26th of March. Tickets are available for that one as well at the moment. So if you want to come up to our Dark Sky site, tickets are available for the public and for our members as well. Um, you can find links to the raffle and to the Messier Star Party on our website, on Facebook as well. Uh, and we have our Lantern Slide event at Dees Brewery in Glen Iris. On the 28th of Feb, we're going to crack out the 90-year-old lantern slide with the 90-year-old glass plate slides and project them in all their glory. Um, we can see Andromeda Nebula and uh, Eta Argus, as they were known back then, uh, in beautiful black and white uh, as imaged 
90 plus years ago. In fact, some of the moon images that we're going to be able to look at uh, from the 1870s and 1880s, and same with the uh, solar eclipse images as well. We've got some comet images that are from uh, 1912 and uh, 1920. Um, so, yeah, grab your tickets to that. It's a three-course dinner. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of the ASV and run through these slides and talk about the slides. Once again, tickets are available on the website and on Facebook as well. Now, there's a whole... Oh, Neil's disappeared. He's got to feed the cat before he gets eaten by the cat. He will be back shortly. Let me jump back mm -hmm. over to Anne-Marie's colourful image for stack of Ida Carina. And Anne-Marie's going to jump across shortly to the Statue of Liberty Nebula. Um, so we've got a couple of comments here, Cigar and Greg. Um, live streams are a great idea. They are, yes, absolutely. Subscription time event type events for live streams, Cigar. No, it's, uh, that's getting too complex for us. We're very basic people. <laughs> Um, we might look into that in the future. Um, we want to try and keep it free for everybody um, as much as we can as well. So, um, we, like I said, we just want to bring these live streams to you guys. Now, Andy's off doing so. Everyone's disappeared on me. They're all running away and doing stuff. I probably, I was probably talking too much. That's the problem. Oh, that's a good one. Do you like that picture? Is that, that's is awesome. that Statue of Liberty, is it? That's the Statue of Liberty. Best oh, Statue of Liberty in the tribe of the sea. Is that a problem there? Uh, I think so. You need to move on to somebody else's screen now. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump on over to Andy's and we're going to have a look Thank at you. <laughs> what are we doing here, Andy? What are you up to? <laughs> I'm eating. I'm um, your face. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I take I didn't see myself. <laughs> Nice rainbow. I've just done a, a focus there. using my Barton off mask, which is, um, I've just pulled off, and that's an image. Wait a sec, I'll, I'll get it, I'll bring it in now. I don't know if you can see my screen. Oh, hang on, hang on. Where yeah. I'll make you solo. One of these things. You can be hand solo. Yeah, how's that? Now, that yeah, I'll put that in front, and what that does that gives that image which you could see before, and it means you can focus. So, what it does. Now I have to go back to the image. Yeah. As I'm focusing, this line moves to the left and right. And you need to pretty well get it in the middle. I've just done a very quick, fast and dirty focus. It's fine for now. And now I'm going to slew off to the next uh, object. Um, it's taking well, me a while to get this camera you do together. That, it's, oh. While you do that, I'm going to do a bit of a shameless self-promotion. Because um, we were just talking about there before galaxies and whatnot. And um these guys use fancy equipment i don't i just use my phone um, it's all relative and... mate i bet so most people would look at your stuff and say well that's pretty fancy <laughs> well i don't know if you can see it just there but in the bottom sort of left hand portion the little fuzzy line is sombrero galaxy um now i took that with my phone camera and an 80 mil short tube orion telescope uh, two nights ago if you lean across, Mark, we can see it behind you. Sorry? If you lean over, we can see the telescope behind you. Oh, yes, you can. This this little one here, this tiny little thing here uh, with a phone, atta phone attached to it um, in border light skies, lovely light polluted skies. I, I fell off my chair when I looked at the first, um, first image I took on the phone and had a look at it and went, oh, my God, I actually got it. It's um, quite shocked, quite shocked. Galaxies Very, are a challenge to image. So getting it with a tiny telescope <laughs> and a smartphone yeah. is an achievement. Yeah, <laughs> very happy with that one. As I said, I can retire from astrophotography now. I don't have to do it anymore. Oh, Anne-Marie's got cloud. Oh, oh, Jen, have you got something you can share with us? Um, I'm just trying the Statue of Liberty now. Okay, cool. I've nearly got three minutes, so we'll see what comes up when it's ready. All right, I'm going to jump back to Andy's. I'm going to have a look at what Andy. Andy, where are you moving to? Well, I'm just going to look at quick. Oh, come on, I'm aligned. All right, I'm just trying to align the scope and I just don't want to do it. But anyway, I'm just going to go to a cluster. 
Oh, um, here we go. Nice globular. Which one are you? Globular, globular or an open? No, no, I'm just going to quick cluster. I'll get rid of this. I might just swap because um, this is live, but I'll, I will. Um, I might just actually disconnect this camera and reconnect it in a different software. There we go. I can do that. Bye. <laughs> Where are we? Here we go. This one here. And I'll hook it up to here. Ask on. Hopefully, it'll work. I've been playing around with a, a program called Nina lately, and it's um, been really good. Um, it's not good for stuff on the fly. Now, this should be. Here we go. Oh, it's jewel box. Where's Paul when you need him? <laughs> I hope he's watching. I picked that. I love it. I was taking images of that one the other night. So, Noel, uh, Noel I called you, Noel. There we go. First we one. Go. Go. <laughs> that one. We need a swear jar for you saying Noel instead of <gasps> Jewel box cluster. What do you know about that one? Um, not a great deal because my interest is more in nebulae rather than clusters. Clusters are kind of, you've seen one, you've seen them all, at least oh. <laughs> in my view. But um, the dual box cluster, like yeah. all open clusters, is a, a group of stars that basically they're all siblings. They're all born from the same cloud of gas and dust. They all came uh, to life around the same time. And they're all traveling together through the, uh, through the Milky Way galaxy, at least for the time Stop being. It. Um, all star clusters will eventually drift apart and separate because of the influence of other nearby stars, gravity pulling them in every which direction. Um, but for the time being, whenever you see a little cluster like this, chances are good that they are all siblings born from the same gas cloud in the same area. There is one exception, however. That orange star you can see towards the middle, that is a red giant star, and red giant stars are old. Whereas everything else, because it's all still in roughly, you know, in the same area together, that means they're all relatively young. Otherwise, they'd have drifted apart by now. So the orange star is actually a foreground star. It's a star that's between us and the cluster behind it. It just happens to be in the line of sight. So it appears to be in the cluster. So I know, look, the things I know about it, it's, it's age and how far away it is. It's about 14 million years old, and it's around about 6,500 light years away. That's very young, 14 million. Our mm. sun is about 4,500 million years old, and it's only mm -hmm. halfway through its life. Exactly. So these are very young stars. Very young stars. These are just six-second or seven-second um, yeah, you don't, need much, you don't need no. much with your box. No. Oh, Lee, have you got clear skies? Far from it, but I'm still getting uh, rosette at the moment. Oh, I'll probably clear across. it off in a moment and get way the out of line there, Lee. Uh, we're going to jump across to it anyway. <laughs> way out of line. Yeah, oh. it's not till the end of the night. That's all I've got. <laughs> We can see the cloud in that shot, though. We can see the cloud. But you can also see Rosette quite well. Yes, indeed. Are you shooting that narrowband, Lee? Yeah, the Tate at the moment. Yes, I thought so, because the, the contrast is quite nice. You can see a lot of the structure in there. So what I mean by narrowband is that Lee is using a filter, which filters out all colours except for that of hydrogen alpha, the, the colour that hydrogen glows in its first step of uh, emission when it loses the uh, the first level of energy into a photon. It's that red to pink color. Uh, well, actually, hydrogen alpha is very, very red. Hydrogen beta is a kind of teal blue color. And so when we look with our naked eye or take images with um, color cameras, it ends up looking a, a pinky purpley color. But um, using narrowband, the colors that you're seeing here, if it was a color image, would be pure red. Go. Now, do you know much about Rosette, Neil? I can talk a little bit about it. Yes. Um, yeah, you can probably see in the very middle there, 
just like we were looking at previously, is a star cluster. And that star cluster, it's in the middle, not because of coincidence. Uh, and in fact, you can see, oh, here's, a, here's one we prepared earlier. <laughs> you can see that it's almost like a donut in that there's a hole in the middle. And that hole is because the star cluster that formed from the gas and dust surrounding it is actually now blowing that gas and dust away because when stars start their, their, their life, they, they ignite in fusion, they generate stellar winds, just like we have the solar winds. And those winds, which is essentially a flow of charged particles and uh, dust, they exert a pressure on that gas and dust that are nearby. So it sort of sweeps the area around the star clear of gas and dust. And that's what we can see happening here. All those stars in the cluster in the center are blowing away from them the dust from which they were formed. And it's making this beautiful donut appearance, although it's described perhaps more romantically and perhaps more accurately as a rose, which is why we have the rosette name. Now I'm calling it a donut with cracked icing now. <laughs> So the dark pit, the dark bits that are forming the cracked icing, what are they? Ah, uh, they're a different reason. So the middle is a hole, a circular area, but we've also got these sort of rivers of knotted cord going through it. And those dark areas, they are gas and dust, but they're not absence of gas and dust. That is a concentration of gas and dust that happens to be between us and the stars. And so we are seeing the shadow side of them. The red gas and dust that you can see glowing, that's on the far side of, the, of the, the stars or at least around the stars. And so it's glowing. But the, the dark stuff is actually between us and the background. And so it's blocking the light. And the reason why it's blocking the light is because it's relatively thick. It's relatively dense. In fact, you can see, it, as I said, it's like a knotted rope. Each of those knots is a, a clump of gas and dust that has been pulled together under its own mutual gravitation. And because it's thicker there, that gravitation will draw in more gas and dust, which will increase its mass and therefore increase the gravitational pull. And that's essentially a positive feedback loop that will eventually, most likely, lead to the birth of a new star in the middle of that clump. So what you're looking at there is essentially stars in a nursery about to be born. Oh, look at that. So this is the live view right now. Yeah, so you can see even just part of the um, the process of stacking itself has gotten rid of a lot of that initial cloud. It's still around, but if I kept going on this, some of the, a lot of that cloud would disappear. That's only doable, though, if it's thin enough cloud to get an image through. If it's completely thick cloud, no amount of time exposing it will, will rescue an image from that. No, but I'd just remove those stacks. I'd remove those images from the stack altogether. Yes. Yep. All right. I'm going to jump over to Andy now, who's got a lovely globular cluster. And I reckon... And, and a satellite trail. And a satellite. <laughs> Starlink. Omega. Omega, yes. Omega Centaurus cluster, and it's only how far above? It's I think it's, it's eleven degrees. Right now. Right. Hey, it's pretty low at the moment. Yeah, twelve. What are we looking at? Um, Forty-seven apparent sixteen hours, fourteen degrees above the horizon for me. Which, very, very if you were standing on a street, it would be below the street lights. Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's how low it is. Yep, very low. Now, the so, closest street light, if I look south, is probably about 150 kilometres away. Oh. You know? So, you lucky bastard. Half, half your luck, man. Yeah. But what have I been getting lately? I've been getting a, a glow towards the south, and I'm going, what town is it? And I'm thinking, no, there's nothing really there. Maybe Mount, and it's. It's Aurora. It's a, off the South Pole. You get a, uh, yes. a, a glow from the, to the south every night lately. We've been having a bit um, of activity been, lately. Yeah, had a bit of a, an Aurora the other night, um, about a week ago. It's pretty – it was dim, but it was just a glow for me. 
and I didn't do any exposure. I just went out and looked with my eyes. But um, well, if you could see yeah. a dim glow with your eyes, you could probably get a decent image with it. Yeah, I didn't take any imaging. I, I think Anne Marie did. She got a good image. Um, and a few other people got the images, and I was just, I went out. I was very tired. I just had a look and go, "Yep, that's it." <laughs> went back inside because of, I, but you know, I had all my gear down the other where I am in my tent, so. Um, yeah, a lot of time it's, I just need multiple gear and I will have soon. I have my imaging train and then I'll have a quick DSLR just ready to quickly hook up and and capture stuff like that. Um, but this is just, I might, I've got no um, darks yet. So I might have to just take some, let's see if it finds any darks. Here we go. This should get rid of some of the red pixels and the blue pixels. Maybe. I thought they were bonus stars for a while there. Yeah, well, I, I can turn them off. Look, I'll go, I'll go <laughs> and turn off the bonus stars. Turn off the bonus stars. <laughs> Here go we go. away, bonus yeah. stars. We don't want you. So have we spoken about um, age, distance, things like that yet? We haven't, have we? Shows I've been paying attention. Sorry, I had two children uh, distracting me there for a moment. <laughs> you're talking about us or? Well, you guys are other, other children. You, you're, my, you're my ASV children, yes. What are you talking about? You're the kid, Mark, out of all I'm of us. Absolutely the kid. 16-year-old boy <laughs> trapped in a 44-year-old man's body. <laughs> So we're, we're talking about something that's like uh, about 16, 17,000 uh, light years away. Uh, 16 or 17,000 light years. That yeah, sounds like it's outside our galaxy. 17,000? Yeah. Uh, that, that was me throwing you an option for uh, a, a opportunity for you to answer. <laughs> Why, yes, Neil, it is outside our galaxy. It's all <laughs> our galaxy is... <laughs> It's, uh, it's actually a very, very, very huge globular cluster. It's the very largest by a factor of 10 that we know about in our Milky Way galaxy. And it, ha <clears throat> it has over 10 million stars in it, which is absolutely gargantuan. Mm -hmm. Do you know how, you know how big it is as uh, well, diameter-wise? No, I don't actually. 150 light years in diameter. Wow. Now, I've always wondered, is this a start of a galaxy? Well, actually, it's it's like a very long. early. It's it, you know, there is more talk likely that it was, the death of a galaxy. Was a galaxy that there's was a galaxy. The remnants of a galaxy that we ate, not us, but the Milky Way. So it's up, the out. core of a once um, spiral galaxy that was cannibalized by the Milky Way. That is a, a recent and a very likely theory, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's got uh, it's got like four million solar masses in it, so it's it's just huge. Anne Marie says that she's not going to get any clear sky till five a.m. So we're going to stream for a while tonight, guys. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good night, by the way, Beatrice. Thanks again. for joining us. <laughs> I just leave it running. Yeah, so Carl's got a good question. How many uh, images? How many rigs are we imaging with tonight? Who's actually uh, doing uh, imaging? My rig doesn't image. Oh, that was a good day, yeah. Jake. That was. <laughs> no. Yeah. We have four four rigs out imaging. So I've got two. Scopes. Oh, hang on. How many have you got? Two Lee? scopes on the one mount. I've two got two. two. You got two. Two on the one mount. Yeah. Andy, how many have you I've got? got? Three. No, I've got, no, I've got two, but one's not imaging. <laughs> yeah, two. And Jen, how many you got? You've just got one. Two. 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 Oh, gosh. All it's you like, guys with multiple astronomy rigs. It's I'm like we've got, eight, we've got eight rigs going at the moment, and we can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless you can image through the cloud, that would be a pretty special rig. Just going to go uh, the X, X, gotta get the X-ray unit going. No, you got to get the cloud filter, anti-cloud filter going. So, Lee, have you got something on your screen ready to share, or no? I'm still. I'm just trying to um, adjust a few things. Uh, I think. Um, yep. Sorry, I think Jen's got something that we can throw up. 
Oh, this is this is what Air Marie was trying to get earlier, mm. except it's sideways. The two. It's not sideways. There's no up or down in space. Yeah, there there is with this one. Now. There is. With this one, there is. There we go. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's just five minutes. That's five minutes. Wow. Yeah. Impressive. Neil, what are we looking at? Uh, we French are looking lady. at, uh, surprise, surprise, a cloud of gas and dust. <laughs> We've heard that before. <laughs> Otherwise known as Statue of a Liberty. Nebula, or in this case, the Amblia. appearance of the Statue of Liberty. Yes. So if you, uh, can we zoom in a little bit on that one, please? Okay. So if you look in the center there, we've got these big looping arches of faint gas and dust, but underneath that, You've got some sort of high contrast gas and dust, some dark areas and some bright areas. Uh, the dark areas towards the center of those loops you can see at the top of that <coughs> central area. Uh, it looks like it might be an arm holding up, maybe holding a torch and a head looking up at it. And then underneath that, maybe something with a, a robe over the shoulder and standing on a platform. Well, um, folks often say that that looks like the Statue of Liberty. And yeah, I can see that. That's fair enough. But uh, it's a very beautiful object, which is showing an enormous variety of, of structures, uh, dark nebulae, uh, expanding shells of, of uh, gas and dust from either explosions or other um, stellar events and thicker areas of emission and reflection nebulae uh, in the nearby areas. Also, overlooked because of its neighbor is that stuff just out to the left there which is also very beautiful but it just doesn't happen to look like a patriotic statue <coughs> i can actually if you give me a moment i can pull up an image of this one that i've done before which um is a narrow band image so i was imaging it with oxygen hydrogen and sulfur filters um, but I've mapped them to different colors, which of course you don't really map them to their natural colors because they don't work as an image because you get red, red and teal when you need red, green and blue. Um, but uh, it still looks pretty cool. I'll just need to, to find it on my computer. So give me a second. Are you, are you showing off, Neil? Is that what we're doing? Oh, well, everyone else has been showing their images. Why can't I show one? <laughs> yeah, I've, one got my, I've, got, earlier. I've got my narrow band up there too. Sorry, Jen, Jen's taking center stage at the moment. <laughs> and Jen is welcome to it because she is an extraordinarily talented imager. Uh, Thank absolutely you. deserves You're to have that spot. You'll make her blush. You'll make her blush. <laughs> uh, I'm going to jump over to Andy's because he's got it on as well. No, I haven't. No, you don't know what. That's not it, Andy. That looks like you've got stars playing um, something against. No, I'm just I'm moving moment. stuff at the moment. All right, we'll go. Um, we'll go to Lee's version. We'll jump over to Lee's. Cigar so saw a dancing kid, and now he can't unsee it. Lee, what did you see? <laughs> oh, uh, let me see if I can find that one. Hang on. Cigar, <laughs> so um, yeah, you, you're going to freak out at this one. You're going to go no, nah, now. Nah, I'm never going to unsee this either. No, that's not it. You didn't see the key. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> the Karen Nebula. Yeah. Well, it's it's a it's a character from. Um, Jimmy Neutron. Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard to see what it's referring to when it's covering it. Oh, hang on, leave it there, leave it there, leave it there. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna jump across. Here we go. Hang on, I'll. Uh... And that's my interpretation. That's of it. that's that's. Wow, look at the colors. So in this case, we've got hydrogen in red, oxygen in blue, and sulfur in um, green. So. Where we've got the red areas, that means it's primarily hydrogen. Where we've got the yellow areas, that's hydrogen and um, actually, no, that's the, the blue and the green together, isn't it? So that's uh, oxygen and sulfur. I can't answer that. You have to answer that, Neil. Yeah, I can't remember. That's above my pay grade. This is three years ago I did this one. You should do astrophotography. You're pretty good at it. Yeah, I might do it sometime soon. <laughs> it's been now, a tough year, okay? Equipment <laughs> issues as well. <laughs> I'm just picking. Andy, is yeah, yours ready not. to have a peek at? Not yet. Sorry. Oh. 
the viewers want live stuff. None of this, you know, showing off how cool we can do when we've got 50 hours worth of data stacked and processed stuff. Well, this isn't 50, but it, it's about 14, which is a long one for me. It's not 50, it's about 14. <laughs> it's one of my longest exposure um, I'd break objects. my computer if I tried to stack 14 hours. Yeah, but because you're shooting in five-second bursts, aren't you? Yeah, uh, 30. Right. These are five-minute ones, five-minute subs. Yeah. That's that's impressive. Seriously impressive. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going to jump over... Screen there. I'm going to jump over to Lee because he's moving to an object, and I just... I like letting... Oh, wishing well. I like letting the viewers see the behind the scenes of what we're doing. Um, so what, what are you using Stellarium, which is hooked up to your equipment? Yeah, so Stellarium I set to, um, so I can choose where I want to go and you can actually see the scope coming in to land, so to speak, where I told it. Um, the scope has landed. I can actually see it's, um, I'm pretty sure that's roughly where it is. Uh, then I'm going to go to one there. of the images. Sorry, I can see some cloud in the uh, the preview. Yeah, the, yeah, that's the only other problem. Um, we don't so, talk about cloud. No, no, no. So <laughs> Just... this this image here is on the um, the smaller field of view scope, which is a, an eight inch uh, SCT. It's not out of focus at the moment, but I'll I'll go over to the smaller scope which looks like it was last on rosette because I recognise that as being rosette. Yeah, I do too because that's all I can see through my eyepiece visually. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just wait for uh, one frame to come through. And Just while you're waiting, I'll let folks know that the, software that, um, the software that Lee was using to control his telescope, Stellarium, it's uh, a very powerful, very useful, and very free piece of software on the desktop. Uh, you can free, get it yeah. on your smartphone as well, which will cost a, a little bit of money. But um, if you want to just explore the night sky during the daytime and perhaps prepare to see what's up in your sky at night, Stellarium is an outstanding tool to do that. And if you want to you know, become a bit more invested in doing astronomy, you can connect your telescope up to it and it's a really handy way to control it too. Yeah, it's got like, you, it, when you go to objects here, you get a lot of the information about it, seeing where it is, where it's going to be best to view or, um, you know, and a lot of controls you can do to change the times uh, and so on. So where's this going? I'm going way out of focus. Always out of focus, Lee. Can't take you anywhere, can we? Sorry, I'm... Lee probably That's just needs some ADHD that. medicine and it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's wishing well there now. You're reverbing a bit there, Lee. Oh, it wasn't me. I think someone's not got headphones on and it's uh, giving oh, some we'll feedback. Oh, we'll blame Andy. It's always Andy's fault. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, now, this camera's on its side, though, unfortunately. Um, we should be able to see the same formation there. Yeah, it, this is the problem with mono is... Again, going back to sort of a bit of what um, Neil was saying earlier, and there was some audio. Um, Who was playing the piano there? The Star Clusters, you know, I, it's not to say they're boring, but they're even they're even more boring in mono. <laughs> I like Star Clusters, especially the one that that Michael has requested. If someone can jump over to it, forty seven can I? I think 47 to Kane is below our horizon because it's uh, further north of the um, Southern Cross and that puts it below our horizon at the moment because the Southern Cross is low. Yeah, you're right. Oh. See, wishing, wishing well can look all right. 
that's a good example of how images can look dull in mono and much better in yeah in color and that's actually a great example right there um of what i was saying earlier about how these star clusters are young stars as opposed to the other ones in the background there are older stars and you can tell that because of their color so blue stars they burn through their energy very very quickly they will typically have a lifespan of 10 to 100 million years which is nothing in the, the scale of things for star lives um, because th their blue means that they're hot which means that they burn their energy which means that they will go through that quickly and die young um, so they are all young stars that's thus because they are blue and all the background stars that you can see are a lot more yellow so they have persisted a lot longer but you can see they're not in the structure of a cluster that we're seeing in the foreground you actually have mixed amongst those blue stars a few brighter yellow ones they are the same as the stars in the background but just the closer ones and so we're seeing them in the line of sight of the view to the cluster but not actually part of the cluster itself right now i just want to let everybody know those watching at home that this year it's windy out there. as part well, it's, yeah, i wasn't going to let them know it's windy because i'm sure if it's windy they'll know uh that this year being the uh 100th anniversary of the ac uh we are responsible for NACA, the national australian convention of amateur astronomy running from april 16th to probably april 23rd and maybe maybe another week depending upon how many speakers uh we get NAC is usually held over one weekend through Easter, but this year, because of good old COVID and struggling to find somewhere to place the venue and get people from interstate, Perth, I'm looking at you. Um, we're doing it online. Uh, so there'll be a series of talks over a series of nights uh, for probably a, a one to two weeks uh, throughout uh, we'll different speakers. What was that, Lee? No, not me. Oh, not you. Um, so there'll be speakers talking about uh, all talks, all sorts of uh, astronomical topics, scientific papers, workshops. Uh, we're hoping to do a, a little bit of a doco on the Leon Mao Dark Sky Site, the uh, Great Melbourne Telescope in Melbourne Observatory, and other speakers. More information is going to come along soon, but there will be a series of um talks over those that sort of week to two week period um that we'll be focusing on for NACA. so keep an eye out for that and i'm going to jump across you, to jen if, if you attend every one of the talks from NACA, i can promise you you'll be completely knackered at the end <laughs> <laughs> oh well played neil well played so this i've just jumped across to jen she's got um running chicken the what the chicken what's it called isn't it running chicken yeah. nebula it is it's yeah. such a bizarre name bok, 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 bok. with lots of bok it's yeah, got so some bok we're making here uh those little dark nodules of gas that you can see in the middle there um similar to what we saw in the rosette nebula but without those filaments connecting them um they are the same thing with dense bubbles of gas and dust that are starting to collapse under their own mutual gravitation and potentially eventually form a star they are known as bock globules named after the astronomer that first described them um, and we love the pun the fact that these bock globules are visible in the chicken nebula and of course we've got and one bock two bock three bock 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 we timed that well didn't we <laughs> you guys are bad turkeys uh, no, yeah. we're being chickens. There's no turkeys in this nebula. I can't so, see the chicken either. No, I, look, I can't see the chicken. I, it's just a, 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 an image full of swirling gas and dust for me. It's one of those things where its name doesn't do it justice. No, no. It it's a beautiful object, six and a half thousand light years away. It's, um, and good evening, Paul. Thank you for joining us. Oh, we do another viewer. Hey, welcome. Now, do you know much about the um, the running chicken nebula, Neil? 
Um, not really beyond what we've already talked about with other nebulae yeah. and the bob globules. I oh, know uh, it's not a great deal. Not, not a great deal to know about that one, is there? Well, um, the thing is, nebulae are pretty much they have very many common things in common with each other. Uh, some nebulae are unique in certain ways, but the vast majority of nebulae, like the universe, they're pretty consistent across space and time. Um, a, a nebulae in our galaxy will be very, very similar to a nebulae in any other of countless galaxies because the universe, it works the same way on all scales, at least as far as we've been able to tell. Um, there are some unusual and special nebulae like the Eta Carina and the Orion Nebulae, and they're um, nebula, sorry. They're some of our favourite ones just because they're, they're unusual and unique in their own way. Um, the running chicken nebula, aside from those box globules, probably the most unique thing about it is its name. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, it's a beautiful object that it we is a beautiful object. like to image. Mm. I'm going to uh, jump over to Anne Marie's because 5 a.m. is hit and she's got some clear sky. <laughs> Oh, very nice. I think that's a, a someone's helmet left up there, isn't it? It is. It is. He needs to go Chris. and pick it up. It's Howdy, Thor's Chris. helmet, that one. So Thor's helmet's a cracking shot. Now, can you rotate that image, Anne-Marie? Or, or are we out? No, I right? can't on this. Not that, I'm, not that I'm aware home. of anyway. Can you Everybody turn watching laptop at home? upside down? Please turn your head <laughs> upside down. Miss <laughs> James. You turn your head right. upside down. Hang on. We're going to have to ask all of our viewers to, uh, to, to do this. If you, if you can screens do this. Or TV screens upside down. <laughs> turn your head upside down. You will see what we're talking about with uh, Thor's helmet there. And you can see the, the wings off the top of it. And then that round bit is obviously the top of the helmet. And good evening, Gerald. Welcome to the stream. Hope that uh, headache is uh, better. Gerald was. I was hoping to get Gerald to join us in the live streaming tonight, but um, he wasn't feeling too crash hot. So, hope you're feeling better, young man. Now. A little bit about Thor's helmet. Obviously, we know it's an emission nebula. It has a um, it has one of um, Stefan's favourite things sitting in the middle of it, which is a Wolf Rayet star. Um, it's in a brief sort of it's in a pre supernova stage at the moment. That Wolf Rayet star. Um, and oh, there we go. Gerald's feeling much better. Uh, and. Thor's helmet, I guess, it's, it's a little bit like a a, um, a bubble nebula in the way it looks. Oh, I see it now. You see the Wolf Rayet in there? No, I see the Thor's helmet. It really oh, you see the like Thor's it. helmet? <laughs> yeah, oh. I'll put myself upside down. Yeah, turn yourself oh, you off. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's, let's, let's... There we go. There we go. Yeah, I see it now. <laughs> Bendy Science <laughs> Preacher. Oh, that's it. From now on, your name is the Bendy Science Preacher because you turn upside down. There we go. <laughs> And it, now, if we could superimpose your face underneath that helmet, you'd be Thor. <laughs> <laughs> here we go. Oh, uh, no, we, we're we're my, just doing yeah. circle work at the moment. Oh, yeah, now I can see it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's like working with children, I'll tell you what. <laughs> yeah. know, isn't it you called that one too early earlier. Yeah, I did call it too early. <laughs> oh, man, I feel like the expert here amongst amateurs, you know. That's a scary thing. I, I know enough to be dangerous. Our Thor's helmet's about 12,000 light years away. In, to be frank, um, Mark, you'd be dangerous even if you knew nothing. Yeah, true. <laughs> if I knew nothing, I'd probably be more dangerous. <laughs> it's in the constellation of Canis Major. Oh, who's that lost? sounds like someone's guiding is being interrupted by Clarence. Yeah, who's lost guiding? Yeah, who lost guiding? Who was that? Who was it? Own up. I'm not guiding. guiding so I'm not guiding. Well, you're on I'm mute, so it can't be you. I moved before I stopped fighting. Oh, it was Jen. It was Jen. <laughs> That's um, with my folks, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that you hear that you heard a moment ago is the sound that breaks that makes every uh, uh, astrophotographer break out in cold sweats. <laughs> panic yeah. mode, yes. <laughs> panic mode, panic mode. <laughs> All right, we're gonna jump across to an old favorite now. Hey. As I was mentioning, Orion Nebula. The Great Orion Nebula. 
This one is an absolute beauty. It's it's one of the most beautiful nebulae in the night sky. It's also probably what the one that most people are familiar with because it's so bright and it's so easy to find. Just about any um, astronomy night that you go to in the summer months, you will be able to see this through someone's telescope. It's always a, a crowd pleaser and a, a favourite of uh, astrophotographers and visual observers alike. I still remember the first time I saw this through the 40-inch. I don't think I'll ever forget, really. You could actually see... 40 inches of what, Mark? Telescope. 40 inches of telescope up at our dark sky site. You could actually see the colour in it. What are you doing there, Andy? You're showing off your toilet, are you? Yep. Now, that's... that's Well, you're talking about a 40-inch. This is a 6-inch, right? So this is quick <laughs> reference... So, oh, so this six is, inch is what you're using tonight. Yeah. So you think what a forty inch would see? That the you know, if a six inch can see this, and in thirty seconds, um, yeah. So a a forty inch would it'd be amazing. You'd, the colours they reckon you can see colours if you you've got full dark vision, which you know you've, you've had at least twenty minutes to, and you just flick a tiny bit of white light at you and activate all your cones, you'll see the colour for half a second, but you ruin your night vision at the same time. <laughs> right? So it's a real, it's a real trade-off, but you can do it. You can to see the colours because you, you, your cones aren't very active um, active in the dark. Your rods are, which is just pretty well black and white, but your cones are very inactive. But you need to activate them by shining a bit of white light sideways, but then you ruin your night vision. So you'll get a quick – you'll see the colours – and then you ruin it for the for another half an hour, and probably for everyone else oh. around you. <laughs> <laughs> White light, yeah. <laughs> White light, you have to get stuff thrown at you, <laughs> heavy stuff. Yeah. So, Neil, what do you know about Orion Nebula? Well, uh, Again, it's it's very similar to other nebulae. It's a huge cloud of gas and dust, mostly hydrogen and oxygen. The pink stuff that you can see there is the hydrogen and the teal stuff is the oxygen. Again, that's because the atoms in the gas and dust that are being excited, energized by the stars nearby, they absorb some of the energy and they can't hold onto it. They're unstable, so they re-emit it, but they do so at a very specific wavelength. So the pink or the red for hydrogen and the green teal for oxygen uh, we've also got some beautiful dark nebulae uh, obscuring some of the stuff behind it. You can see there, particularly at the top center of that image. Um, the little comet, comma shaped tail thing at the top of Orion, uh, that is actually a spherical nebula that is centered around that star in the middle. And it's a beautiful example of how the gas that is near an energetic star will glow because of the energy that it's absorbing. But when you get a certain distance away from it, that energy drops off to the point where the dust can't absorb it anymore. It reflects it. Now, it doesn't look spherical because of that little filament of dark um, gas over the top of it. But if you, in your mind's eye, remove that piece of, of dark nebulosity from in front of it, you can see that behind that, it's a perfectly spherical uh, em emission nebula. Now, other nebulae we see aren't spherical because it's usually a cluster of stars that's illuminating nearby gas and dust. So it's a lot more chaotic and uneven shaped. But keep an eye open in the future when you're looking at photos of nebulae for these stars that are separated from the rest and are illuminating the nearby nebulosity in a perfect sphere. And you'll see that that is actually the true structure of nebulosity around an energetic star. Because once you get a certain distance from it, the, the uh, energy drops off to the point that atoms can't absorb it anymore. They just simply reflect it. Now, I can see Running Man up the top there. We got that in. Oh, there he is. I call him the Gingerbread Man. He looks like a Gingerbread Man to me, not a Running Man. I've seen someone else describe it as the uh, the uh, Nike Air logo with one of the stars yeah, playing the basketball. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yep, Nike Air logo. The swoosh. No, no, the guy with the basketball doing the slam dunk. Oh, the yeah, okay, yeah. This this one. 
<laughs> yeah, that one. I jump across to yours, Lee. You've got Orion as well, but a much wider view with cloud. Yeah, I'm just um, so I've got my three um, three filters again with the cloud. So HA O uh, O three and sulfur. And I'm just trying to see whether I'm trying to get these to actually process in parallel. Um, so oh, you're trying more. to get them to work together. Yeah, well, I've done it before without meaning to because this is how, like, Anne-Marie's been stacking straight from colour, but this is how you can get an RGB stack within the Nina, the program we've been um, uh, using, but it doesn't like the fact that, oh, <laughs> like this, fine. Um, <laughs> because sure, I, whatever. It fine. Yeah, exactly. It can't align at the moment, one, because it doesn't have enough... Um, Images of each, and there's too much cloud. So, can we, um, can given we stick on the image frame, so the different fine. stars are visible. Yeah, can we Sorry? stick on the OII for a second? Yeah, yeah, look at that. The O3 is definitely the uh, the cleanest of those, I think. Yeah, agreed. So much um, more in there. Go over here and see where it's up to. Take that off. Um, Too many programs for me. Yeah, too much cloud for me. Uh, give him a couple of years and Mark will be doing this with the rest of us. On no, show. no, 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 no. We are, we are, a Andy and I are in discussions to try and work out how I can live image from the phone to the live You're stream. We're going to need some night. software to do that. We're going to need some software for that, but we, we quite, we, we, we'll work it out. We'll work it out. We'll give it a go. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. May need a different phone to do that, but yeah, we'll give it a shot. A oh, Pixel 5's for sale. <laughs> I need a phone that doesn't require a mortgage. It's for sale <laughs> second hand, mate. <laughs> oh, your one. Oh, okay. yeah. Might have to borrow it and um, see how it works first. Try it out. Break it, yeah. break it, and then get a reduced price. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you sign a waiver first so that you're responsible oh, okay. for any damage. Right. <laughs> Don't know if I want waivers. Well, Lee, while you're mucking around with that, yes, because I'm sure the folks at home don't want to see your screen. They want to see objects. I'm going to jump back over to Andy's. Well, I'm just... Andy's... Uh, oh, you're moving I'm about. Been, I've moved about. And I'm, moving about. I'm just waiting for it to come through, but it's taking its time, of course. Ah, oh, technology. technology. Okay. Gremlins, everywhere. Gremlins everywhere. Gremlins everywhere. Okay, I reckon I'm there. Yeah. I'll just take the time to remind our viewers uh, that as the, the Messier Star Party, obviously, on the 26th of March, tickets available uh, on the website, uh, as well as, obviously, our Lantern Slideshow tickets available on the website. Are you going where I think you're going? Yep. Oh. But I've got to find it My alignment's <laughs> really bad at the moment. I'm, I'm just freehanding this. Oh, so, um, yeah. Andy, I freehanded free every night to get an object on the. I don't have. I don't have uh, tracking like that. I think what we might do is um, we'll get this object going, which is I'm, I'm assuming Andy is horsehead and flame. Yep. Yep. But um. I think we might close it out after Horse, Head and Flame. Um, we've had a lot of fun. Yes, Ian, at least there are no audio gremlins tonight. We apologise for that. That was um, a whole lot of fun last night. That was. Whew. We did get it sorted in the end, so I apologise for that. And I have, it, for those who want to watch it and haven't seen the stream from last night, I got rid of the really bad stuff on the YouTube stream, so it's, it's much clearer. Oh, you're right there now. I can see it. No. Uh, um. I've just this is a bit of a just hang there. I've, I've got to do a bit of quick star alignment because I'm 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 out a little bit. Oh, that's close enough. Close enough is good enough. As near as to make no odds, my physics professor used to say. Why? How? Hang there. Oh. It's just, it's all a bit slow tonight for some reason. 
It's Everyone's the end of the week. Sick. It is. It's the end of the week. It's nearly Friday. 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 <laughs> that's how. That's how big a week I've had. It's nearly Friday. Yay. I thought that must have been a day for a moment. I'm sure someone wrote it like that the other day. F R just F R I Y. Fry? Why? Fry. So what would what what Andy's trying to get for us to close out on is is this. This is Anne Marie's screen. Yeah, but this is one she prepared earlier, obviously. <laughs> We're gonna try Andy's trying to live stack yep. this as a closeout for us. Yep, it'll be there in a minute. Hang there. I've got a uh, change good old settings. Alm, Alm attack and the flame and the horse head yep. and there's another couple in there, a couple of nebulas in there as well. There's one of those um, almost roundish ones that you're talking about, Neil. There on the left as well. That's the left, yep. Yeah. Once I've mentioned it, or well, now that you've heard it, you'll you'll I'm keep not seeing them. Yeah, I'm going to see them everywhere now. I blame you totally. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> How are you going there, Andy? We nearly got it. Uh, nearly. He'll be there. Pressure's on. Pressure's on. Pressure's on. Absolutely pressure's on. Bring us up on the screen so that people have got something to look at, not that they want to look at us. Oh, life stacking paused. He'll be there. It'll come. Oh. First one. First one. First one. Just coming through. Stacks. Here we go. Black point. Get rid of that. Well, I reckon I'm. I'm not exactly. <laughs> that history right round is a bit odd. Oh, while we're waiting, I'm jump across to Emery's. This is not live, is it, Anne Marie? I mean, oh, no, sorry, that's, that's, my, this is that's my screensaver. <laughs> that's Jen. That's Jen. That's Jen's that one. <laughs> oh, that one. <laughs> it is late. What can I say? How are you going there, Andy? If you can't get it, it's all good. Oh, I'll just find them there. Horsey and HA. I'm getting there. Mm. Beautiful object, though. Horse head, flame. Love it. I actually managed to get a little bit of each of those um, with the phone, surprisingly. I couldn't believe that either because it's such a faint object. I got it with a, um, a DSLR. I stacked a whole lot of 30-second images, and oh, that's not it there. That was from um, from my telescope with uh, you know filters and so on. Um, but what I got from the 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 DSLR with a, I think it was just a seventy to three hundred mil lens, I have not been able to re reproduce it, which is um, I got the whole it's lot. Not, it's and not so stacking. I, no. All right. Well, I think what we might do then, we might go. Yeah, sorry, guys. Just it's that's one of those all right. things. We'll bring us all back on the screen. We've we've had a good night. We've gone nearly two hours. So, thank everybody for coming along, and just let everybody know that um, if you're not a member of the ASV and you're interested in becoming a member, www.asv.org.au forward slash join. Uh, if you don't follow us on Facebook yet and you're seeing the stream, please hit the like button. And if you don't follow us on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our next stream. When that is, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we will let you know, though, that's for sure. Um, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Andy, for joining us and for streaming and working through some cloudy conditions and whatnot. Thank you to everybody for watching, and we will see you next time. Hopefully, it'll probably be a week, a uh, couple of weeks, I'd say, before you see us again. But we'll we'll come up with another stream idea and another set of objects to look at, and and we'll, we'll see you back here again.